Brian Hare, Vanessa Wood, Survival of the Friendliest. Understanding our origins and rediscovering our common humanity. Narrated by Alex Vincent and Oliver Maines. To the layman, the phrase survival of the fittest means the natural world is all about competition. Only the roughest, toughest, and most cutthroat species make it out alive. However, survival of the friendliest posits an entirely different perspective, that friends matter more than fights. By examining evolutionary history, these blinks argue that only focusing on brute force and aggression downplays the important role of social skills. In fact, throughout history, friendship, family, and community may have been the true reason for human survival. You'll learn why evolutionary pressure helped Homo sapiens get along, and how the ability to forge friendships and coordinate relationships allowed us to conquer the planet. Let's start with a fun game. Take two cups and hide a treat or colorful toy under one of them. Then present the pair of cups to a baby. Will they be able to find the prize? The answer is yes. That is, if you give them a hint. Just point to the correct cup and watch what happens. By nine months old, most infants can recognize this gesture as an attempt to communicate something important. They'll follow your finger and investigate the indicated item. It may not seem amazing, but it is. It shows that even as children, humans can recognize that other people can harbor knowledge and intentions beyond their own. This is called theory of mind, and it's one of humanity's greatest achievements. The key message here is, humans have evolved special cognitive skills to help us cooperate. At first, theory of mind may seem like a basic cognitive faculty. After all, it seems obvious that other people have their own thoughts, feelings, and individual experiences that may be different from our own. However, this is actually a sophisticated concept that we don't share with even our closest evolutionary relatives. Try playing the same two-cup game with a chimpanzee. You'll quickly end up frustrated. Even if the chimp knows there's food under one of the cups, they won't recognize your pointing as a helpful gesture they'll simply guess. After playing dozens of times, a chimp may catch on a little, but change the gesture even a small bit, and it's back to square one. Interestingly, dogs fare a bit better. If you point to the correct cup, they'll usually investigate that object over the other one. While it remains unclear if they understand the intention of our gestures, they at least instinctively follow them. Why the difference? Well, We've domesticated dogs. Throughout history, we fed and bred dogs that follow our commands. This gave an evolutionary advantage to ones that cooperate well with human communication. Chimps haven't had this evolutionary pressure. Therefore, they haven't evolved the cognitive ability to really apprehend our gestures. So, the ability to conceive of other minds and communicate with them is an evolved trait. But that leaves us with the question, out of all the species of animals on Earth, why do humans have the most honed ability to understand theory of mind? As we'll see in the next blinks, evolution could provide some answers. In 1959, the geneticist Dmitry Belayev moved from Moscow to the far-off city of Novosibirsk in Siberia. Here, far from the skeptical eye of Stalin's government, he began a long-running experiment. Today, you can see the results of his work. Actually, you can pick them up and pet them. You see, Belayev's experiment was an attempt to domesticate foxes, and he succeeded. The scientists began with two groups of wild foxes. One group was left alone, while the others were only allowed to breed if they showed ample affinity for humans. Over time, the two groups significantly diverged. While the control group remained the same, the friendly group developed a whole host of new physical and behavioral characteristics. The key message here is, friendliness is a genetic trait that corresponds to greater communication abilities. Belayev's domestication experiment has been running for more than 50 years. 
His protege, Lyudmila Trut, keeps it running today. The results are stunning. The foxes bred for friendliness are significantly different than their undomesticated counterparts. For one, they look different. The friendly foxes have floppy ears and shorter snouts. Their fur is softer and comes in a variety of colors and patterns. Even their teeth are less sharp. Essentially, they share many of the qualities seen in other domesticated animals, such as dogs or pigs. However, none of these traits were specifically selected for. They're merely byproducts of the primary selection trait, friendliness. However, the most significant side effect of selecting for friendliness isn't a physical feature. It's mental ability. Foxes from the friendly group demonstrate a much sharper ability to communicate with humans. If you present wild foxes with the two-cup test, they'll fail about half the time. In contrast, the friendly foxes are able to follow human gestures to select the right cup. Remarkably, they retain this ability even if they're raised by foxes from the control group. This difference in ability is incredible because it shows that sociability and communication skills are linked by the same genetic process. If evolutionary pressure is selecting for one, it's also improving the other. In fact, this correspondence is also observed in other domesticated animals, such as ferrets and Bengalese finches. In the next blink, we'll examine if this process can occur without human intervention. Can a species self-domesticate? Would you like to live among chimpanzees? Sure, at first it may sound appealing. Maybe chimp life is all about lounging in the jungle and monkeying around. Unfortunately, the reality is a little less lovely. Chimpanzee society can actually be quite brutal. Male chimps routinely patrol their territory and will aggressively attack any interlopers. Even worse, during mating season, they'll violently assault potential mates. Female chimps aren't much better. They'll often fight each other and sometimes even kill their rivals' children. No, if you're looking for a more peaceful primate life, you're better off with the bonobo. While closely related to chimps, this species of ape exhibits much more friendly and cooperative behavior. The key message here is, the friendly bonobo shows all the telltale signs of self-domestication. So if chimp society is violent and competitive, what is life like for the bonobos? Well, for one, it's a lot more laid back. Most notably, there's no combative competition over mates. Rather than males fighting over select females, the females choose who they have relations with. And they choose almost everybody. In fact, for bonobos, sex acts are just a common way to socialize. In addition to fewer fights about mates, bonobos don't descend into violence over food either. Just the opposite. They prefer to share. In one illustrative experiment, scientists placed a series of bonobos alone in a room with fresh fruit and a small door keeping out another bonobo. Without fail, the first ape always opted to let in the second, even if they'd never met before. Chimps, when given the same choice, just eat everything themselves. Unsurprisingly, these friendlier apes also display a few of the notable physical features common in domesticated animals. They have smaller, less pronounced faces and jaws, along with tinier, less fierce teeth. They also have more varied pigmentation, with pinkish lips and tufts of light-colored hair, even when fully mature. And just like the domesticated foxes, bonobos show signs of better communication and cooperation skills. When presented with a task that requires collaboration, for instance, a puzzle that requires two apes to simultaneously pull ropes to get a treat, bonobos can quickly work together. However, their chimpanzee cousins can rarely do the same. These distinct physical traits and more egalitarian behaviors seem to indicate that bonobos have undergone a natural process similar to domestication, but completely in the wild. Their success as a species is strong evidence that in some cases, it must be evolutionarily advantageous to cultivate traits like friendliness, and cooperative social skills. You're walking down the street when a stranger passes by. You don't know him, but his soft, kind face makes him seem trustworthy and reliable. 
He's the type you'd ask for directions if you needed help. Actually, these sorts of friendly faces are all around us. But why? Our outward appearance isn't merely random or superficial. Just the opposite. The contours and dimensions of the modern human face indicate some serious changes within our minds. Remember how Belayev's Siberian foxes changed their physical features as they became more amiable? Our early ancestors may have undergone the same process. Fossil records show that the evolution of early humans may have selected for friendliness as well, and the evidence is written all over our faces. The key message here is, human evolution seems to have favored friendliness. Modern humans, a species of hominid called Homo sapiens, are currently the dominant primates on the planet. However, as recently as 50,000 years ago, we weren't so alone. There used to be at least five other species of hominid on Earth. Yet as time went on, we won out and became the most successful species. What gave us the advantage? One hypothesis is that our early ancestors self-domesticated. That is, evolutionary pressure favored people who were more friendly. But how do social skills give us an edge over our close cousins? Well, an increased aptitude for getting along allows humans to communicate more effectively, form denser, more stable social structures, and collaborate on developing new technologies. Essentially, friendship and community made our species more robust. Scientists studying this phenomenon have found compelling evidence that the rise of Homo sapiens coincided with a corresponding rise in friendliness. Consider this. Testosterone, a hormone linked with competition and aggression, also contributes to specific facial features like pronounced brow ridges and jaws. When we examine the fossil record, we find that as humans became more successful, the average brow ridge and jaw significantly shrunk. This indicates a link between increased sociability and the advancement of our species. Other physical signs of domestication are found in modern faces as well. For instance, compare human eyes to chimp eyes, and you'll find only ours have a white area called a sclera. This loss of pigmentation is another side effect of selecting for friendliness. However, it's also a useful social adaptation. A white sclera makes it easier to apprehend where someone is looking, a key tool for interpersonal communication. Flashing lights, loud music, fluid dancing, and an intense, irrepressible desire to hug everyone in sight. These are some known side effects of illicit ecstasy use. This drug, sometimes called MDMA, is popular at raves, nightclubs, and other hedonistic social environments. It's easy to understand why. Taking a dose floods the brain with serotonin and oxytocin two chemicals closely linked to happiness, elation, and other positive emotions. In most countries, buying ecstasy is illegal. However, luckily for people seeking positive vibes, evolution has made it possible to get a hit of serotonin and oxytocin the old-fashioned way. Just gaze into someone's eyes. Surprising, right? The key message in this blink is... Our brains have evolved to form powerful social bonds, even with strangers. As humans evolved to become more friendly, strong social bonds became an essential tool for survival. After all, there are clear benefits to living in stable, collaborative social environments. Just look at the Hadza community in Tanzania. This group of hunter-gatherers has managed to sustain its community for generations through mutual exchange. Hunters share their kills, gatherers distribute their bounty, and as a result, everyone has enough. So how are human bonds forged? One way is with chemicals like oxytocin. This neurohormone alters the mind by disrupting the amygdala, the section of the brain that processes threats and danger. With the amygdala slowed down, one becomes more open to intimacy with others. In fact, studies show that people dosed with oxytocin display more empathy and are more attuned to others' emotions. In humans, oxytocin is produced naturally during social encounters. 
For instance, after childbirth, both mothers and infants are flooded with this chemical to help seal the parental bond. However, oxytocin is also released when people meet strangers. Simply looking into another human's eyes is enough to trigger this chemical in the brain. As a result, humans seem wired to form positive social relationships. This dynamic helps our species build social networks far beyond our immediate families. In essence, it allowed the creation of a new type of social category, the intragroup stranger. This is someone who you don't know personally, but still treat as part of your group. Neighborhoods, cities, and countries, all large communities we rely on, are possible thanks to our friendliness toward intragroup strangers. However, there's a dark side to this bonding. Clearly, our natural affinity for collaboration and friendliness has helped our species thrive for millennia. Yet, even though our ancestors relied on each other to survive, our human family is not completely free of friction and strife. Consider the story of Rachel. Born in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Rachel hailed from the Banyamulenga community, a small ethnic group known as the Black Jews of Africa. While her childhood was peaceful, her later life was marred by brutal conflict. Throughout the 90s, the Banyamulenga people were continually marginalized and attacked by other political and ethnic groups. The horror culminated in 2004 when an outside rebel group attacked Rachel's refugee camp and killed her entire family. At first, this dark story seems to undermine our understanding of human friendliness. But actually, this cruel violence is related to the same evolutionary pressures that make us kind. The key message here is, our strong social bonds can make outsiders seem less human. Rachel's story is unnerving, but not unique. The sad truth is human history is filled with instances of violence, conflict, and genocide. But how can we understand these barbarous impulses without abandoning our concept of friendliness as an evolutionary advantage? To start, we must look at the downside of forming strong social bonds. While our brain's sensitivity to oxytocin helps us empathize with other members of our group, it has an ugly side effect. Oxytocin also makes mammals more aggressive to outsiders perceived as threats. To get the picture, just imagine how a mother bear will carefully coddle her cubs, but fiercely attack any nearby animal that seems suspicious. So, while humans will extend help and support to strangers perceived as part of their group, those seen as outsiders are subject to the opposite treatment. This is partially because our brains apprehend outsiders with less theory of mind. That means we spend less time empathizing with the thoughts, feelings, and experiences of non-group members. On a neurological level, we treat them as less human. This phenomenon is present at the cultural level as well. When one powerful group oppresses another, it often depicts the outsiders as non-human animals. This is sometimes called simianization and is apparent in everything from propaganda posters to racial slurs. These depictions serve to stoke the natural tendency to hate outsiders. Even so, violence isn't inevitable. By cultivating empathy between groups, it's possible to foster the feelings of shared humanity, which enliven our best instincts. Poland, 1941. The Nazis are busy with the horrific work of rounding up Jewish families into inhumane ghettos. Many of the local population are cowed by the occupying forces and do little to slow the process. However, Andrei Patinsky refused to stand idly by. Patinsky, despite being non-Jewish, risks his life to smuggle food to those in need. Even after he's caught and punished, he and his wife work tirelessly to rescue Jewish people throughout the war. What made the Patinskys, and thousands of other heroes like them, so committed to helping a group others had so easily dehumanized? According to sociologists Pearl and Samuel Oliner, most of these resistors shared one thing in common. They all had close friendships with Jewish neighbors. 
The key message here is, we can foster tolerance with close, casual contact with others. The dehumanizing forces that led to the Holocaust have not disappeared. Unfortunately, all around the world, there are still people committed to hating and oppressing those viewed as outsiders. One prominent example is alt-right ideology. These individuals score high on measures of social dominance orientation, meaning they believe some groups, such as racial minorities, are inherently inferior. How can a society curtail such harmful views from spreading? Some argue that people with backward beliefs should be violently repressed. However, this approach could backfire. Remember, humans tend to dehumanize outsiders when they feel threatened. Heightening that feeling of vulnerability could intensify that outward hatred. A better approach may be to create more spaces for non-threatening interactions between groups. Positive, casual social interaction erodes the negative feelings that fuel hate. For instance, college students randomly assigned roommates of different racial backgrounds are found to be much more tolerant of racial differences later in life. Likewise, in the 1940s, white residents of desegregated neighborhoods were much more likely to support further desegregation. If we want to stop our societies from slipping further toward animosity, we need to ensure people have contact across all sorts of demographic lines. Currently, cities and towns in the United States are often spatially divided. There are rich areas and poor areas, white neighborhoods and black neighborhoods. However, Americans can begin to roll back this entrenched segregation by consciously changing cities to encourage interaction. It's important to fund more mixed-income housing developments, build more inclusive public spaces, and tear down physical barriers that keep people apart. In short, it's important to build cities where people know all their neighbors. During the Second Congo War, conservationist Claudine André had a problem. Kinshasa, her home city, was under siege. Bombs fell every day, clean water and reliable electricity were both hard to come by. To top it all off, André had to take care of a dozen bonobos in these harsh conditions. It wasn't easy, but André went to great lengths to keep the vulnerable apes alive and happy. She let them live in her home and each day drove them to a secluded forest to play and socialize. After the war, she set up dozens of kindness clubs. In these small sanctuaries, local children could meet the bonobos and learn about their lives. Why did Andre want children to meet the bonobos? To her, the reason was simple. It could prevent another conflict. If children learn to respect and love animals, they're more likely to take care of one another. The key message here is, our treatment of animals mirrors our treatment of each other. Humans have lived alongside other animals for as long as our species has existed. While we've often used them for food and as workers, we've also considered animals as family. Our love of animals is even evident in our rituals. All around the world, archaeologists have found ancient burial sites where our ancestors have been laid to rest alongside their canine companions. Given our close social relationships with animals, it should be no surprise that people who foster interspecies friendships are more likely to extend kindness to other humans as well. Psychologists Gordon Hodson and Christoph Don't studied this dynamic. They found that people who attributed more thoughts and feelings to animals also scored higher on measures of tolerance. Another study looked at this phenomenon even more closely. In a survey, scientists asked people if they agreed that some breeds of dog were inherently superior to others. Those who saw truth in the statement also scored highly on measures of social dominance orientation. That is, they also favored hierarchies in human society. Clearly, how we see the animal world and our relationship to other living creatures has implications for how we see each other. Perhaps, if we learn to cultivate a nurturing attitude toward all nature, we'll be more likely to tap into our greatest strength, 
our capacity for friendship. The key message in these blinks is that humans have evolved to be an inherently social species. Throughout history, our ability to survive has depended on cultivating social skills, interpersonal communication, and mutually supportive communities. Unfortunately, our hardwired tendency to bond with those close to us can also make us wary of outsiders who seem threatening to us. To build a more peaceful world, we should strive to form friendships with those around us, even if they seem different on the surface. <laughs>